Well, <laughs> thank you very much for, for being here. We are honored for having the opportunity to, to receive Professor Kenneth Einer Hima. As you know, he needs no introduction. Basically, anybody who's interested in issues uh, pertaining to methodological problems in conceptual jurisprudence will have had to engage with his work, which is, I think, very illuminating and has very interesting proposals regarding the boundaries between conceptual jurisprudence and other disciplines that are called philosophical regarding the law. And uh, he basically, we were talking that he's uh, finishing uh, one of his latest books, and he's been very prolific in this regard. He's been writing a lot in these in years, lots, lots of papers and, and books recently. And without further ado, uh, Professor Hima, the floor is yours, and we are very, very happy to have you here and uh, very eager to hear what you have to say regarding this. Thank you. How, how old are you, Edgar? I am. <laughs> I'm 40 years old. 40 years old. I'm going to yeah. tell you a little story about Edgar. <laughs> um, when he was down at Unum, I would come down there regularly, and we would go, we would go play Sandlot basketball. I'm 60 years old. He's 40. I whooped his ass. <laughs> I whooped his ass, and he lies about it. He tells everybody he won. I won, so everybody <laughs> Edgar can play. <laughs> But not that well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, th this, uh, this, is, uh, this presentation is grounded in the second chapter of a book that just came out um, from, uh, by Oxford, uh, Morality and the Nature of Law. And for the most part, yeah, I have certain misgivings about the, the, the topics in, in the book because to some extent they're played. I spent a lot of time in chapter two, this, this particular, the topic of this particular presentation, talking about um, anti-positivist views, classical, the strong classical natural law view, and then um, much of the rest of the book is devoted to the inclusive, exclusive positivism debate. Both of, and both of these topics are kind of played. Um, you know, nobody's really done a hell of a lot of work on them since the early 2000s. Um, however, what I think is, is nice about the book is that um, I spend a lot of time developing um, the, the methodology for conceptual jurisprudence. And I think what's nice about the book is that I, I try to, to make clear all the time how the methodology that I've, uh, that I've developed or articulated, how it engages with the, and influences the conclusions I draw. What conclusions you draw with respect to a theory of law will depend, um, not trivially, quite substantively, on what methodology you employ. So it's always really important um, at the outset, if you're going to do this stuff, you, need to, you can't just say it's conceptual analysis. People have, a very diff people have different conceptions of what conceptual analysis is. Um, most of which, on my view, obviously are wrong. Everybody has views about how to do conceptual analysis, and if you have a view about how to do conceptual analysis, everybody else's view who disagrees with yours is wrong. I mean, it's just how that works. We have views, other people who disagree are probably wrong. Um, so, what I want to do today is, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about methodology, um, and then most of the time allotted to me talking about methodology and then are and show how what it buys you by way of substantive views with respect to Dworkin, Dworkin's interpretivism and John Finnis's classical natural law view. So, um, how do I do this? Uh, okay. All right, I can't see that far, so I'm unfortunately going to have to track. All right, so let me, let me try to motivate the project of conceptual jurisprudence with kind of a, a silly puzzle. A puzzle about being single. All right, um, we use the term, you know, bachelor to describe a certain class of persons, um, or single, the concept of single. We say someone is single if they have, exhibit certain characteristics. We all think we know what it means, right? If you ask me, am I single? I'll tell you no, I'm not single. Um, generally, we don't have any problems with the application conditions for the concept of being single, but sometimes there are some issues that come up. For example, is the Pope single? I, I, is it okay to ask questions? I'm, I'm curious what your views are, just real quickly. How many people think the Pope is single? How many pe people think the Pope isn't single? 
Okay, this this may be this then may be a, a this may be a this may be a, a language issue here. Okay, so here's here's what I would tell you. Now the Pope isn't single, right? If I want to know whether someone is single, I want to know whether she's dateable, right? That's the point. I, I, I'm not. I'm look. I mean, you know. I mean, if I if I will ask, if, I'll ask. If, am I Edgar? Are you married? No, but I'm not single. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Right. Okay, so generally, you know, if if a, if a woman wants to know if a man is single, she wants to know whether he's dateable. If a man wants to know whether a woman is single, she's dateable. Okay, so um, that would be my answer. Okay, a straight man who commits to never getting married. Is that person single? <laughs> um, that's actually that's actually a more interesting question than I than I thought. Um, I'm tempted to think, in one respect, yes. Is he is he dateable? Yeah, he's dateable. But is it going anywhere? Well, maybe not. It depends on your views, right? I mean, if you you know if you decide that you your long-term marriage, your long-term relationship with, or permanent relationship with a partner, has to involve the sacrament of marriage or a, 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 a civil marriage. Then, nah, he ain't single, right? But if you know, if you're kind of, you're kind of cool with, well, I just go with it. You know, we can have, we can partner up for life and never, never reduce it to, uh, to legal formalities. Then, yeah, he is single. Um, the funny thing is, is one of my best friends. Um, has a partner uh, who, and a family with somebody to whom he's not married and never plans to get married. Um, they recently broke up, so I don't know what that has to do with anything. Um, oh, actually, this is, yeah, and this was also a man who lives and has children with a woman but never marries her. Single or no? How many people think he's single? How many people think he's not single? And how many people are not sure? Yeah. No, he's not single. I mean, he's not single, right? You know, if, I'm, if he's living with a, a woman and has children, and he's kind of holding himself, them out as his family, and his relationship with the woman is a partnership, which is how that sort of works when you live with somebody and have children, uh, he's, he's not single, really. But you see, there's, there's a question here, a, a conceptual puzzle that arises, because normally we think of single as being synonymous with unmarried, being unmarried. And it turns out to be much more the issue turns out to be much more complicated than it would seem given ordinary clear, the, 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 the core, or ordinary core conventions for using the, the term. A gay man in a jurisdiction that does not permit same-sex marriage, is, is he single? Not clear. That one's not clear to me. Okay, so conceptual analysis begins where these puzzles about the meanings of words begin, right? You can already see here that there's a, a, a fundamental relationship between the puzzles that motivate conceptual analysis and the linguistic conventions that determine the ordinary or lexical meanings of a word. Now, okay, that, that's pretty trivial. Um, whoops. Sorry, I forgot to, to do this. Um, if I don't change the slide and, and I start talking about someone, something else and it seems like the slide should be changed, l let, me, let me know because I'll space out on this. Okay. Now, these puzzles that arise in connection with being, the notion of being single or the notion of being a bachelor, um, you know, they're not terribly important. I mean, I, I don't think they're trivial, actually. I, I think they're interesting. I just don't think that they're necessarily important. But there are non-trivial conceptual problems that arise in connection with law as such. Um, can there be something that is properly characterized as a legal system without sanctions? Well, let, here's one way of kind of testing your intuition, right? Spain has a legal system. Suppose that you're in a, a possible society that's exactly like the one in Spain, except that, right, it has a legal system just like the one in Spain, except that there are no laws that permit um, sanctions, fines, penalties, um, coercive court orders. There's no incarceration, no prisons, no police force. Do you have a legal system? How many people think yes? 
How many people think no? Me too. That's the topic. Of this. That's the topic of the second book. But the interesting thing about this is that since Hart, um, you know, up to the up to to the point up to Kelsen, it was taken for granted that law necessarily involved, and you have to be careful. You have to be careful about using the word coercion um, because it's not exactly coercion in the same sense that somebody's pointing a gun at you and demanding your money is, but it's coercion in a weaker sense. Up until Kelsen, it was taken for granted that it was a conceptually necessary feature for the existence of a legal system that it, um, that it authorized coercive enforcement mechanisms. Um, Hart questioned the view in rejecting Austin. Raz questions the view with his Society of Angels argument, and it's pretty much become this, it, it, the doctrine that it's not an essential property of law that it authorizes sanctions has this weird sort of status. Everybody kind of accepts it because no one's made much noise about it, but people tend, generally tend to be more skeptical than the silence about the issue suggests. And you know, the topic of the second book is, again, to argue that, no, 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 there, if it doesn't have sanctions, it ain't a legal system. Another non-trivial conceptual problem concerning law as such. Can there be something properly characterized as a law that's morally unjust, right? The traditional interpretation of classical natural law theory said, uh-uh, right? It's a conceptually necessary feature of a law that it's just, can't be no unjust laws, contradiction in terms. Um, and positivism, of course, denies that. Now, the latter, this latter position is the position that drove the entire debate for hundreds of years, in the debate in conceptual jurisprudence, Blackstone, Bentham, Blackstone, Austin. Um, so these are not, I mean, they're not, tr these are important puzzles theoretically. Um, whether or not they matter practically is a different issue. I'll say something about that um, later on. So, okay, first steps towards understanding conceptual analysis the relationship between conceptual analysis and definitions. Conceptual analysis is related to the ordinary meanings of words as you find them in the dictionary. Okay, now one of the reasons that this puzzle arose with respect to being single was the answer to the question, is the Pope single? If all you're thinking about is the straight up definition of being single, which is unmarried, according to the ordinary meaning, yeah, it does. Um, ordinary meanings tend to fix the content of a concept but, but don't necessarily exhaust it. As it turns out, being unmarried, as far as m many of our intuitions is concerned, it's a necessary condition for being single, but it's not sufficient for being single, at least not the way we use the, the word. Um, right? Because is it reasonable to think that the Pope isn't really single, even though he is, according to it, the idea that um, someone is single if and only if they're un unmarried. Um, and if you think that the Pope is not, is not single, then you're going to think, yes, unmarried is one conceptually necessary condition for being single, but it, there are others as well, right? Some sort of, uh, I guess I would say something like this, one has to be formally and psychologically eligible for marriage, right? If you're committed to never getting married, you're not really single. You know, if you're prohibited by, institutionally prohibited from getting married, um, or legally prohibited uh, from getting married, you're, you're not single. So, ordinary meanings ground the content of a concept, determine the content of a concept, but they don't necessarily exhaust it. Conceptual analysis starts, it starts from ordinary definitions but attempts to identify the deeper philosophical commitments that ground the meaning of words. What's interesting about you know, your responses to these questions, to the extent that you, you know, your responses diverged from what one would expect um, given the ordinary meaning, or one's response was tentative because one wasn't sure. If you're unsure of whether the Pope is single or you think the Pope is not single, then it must be because you have certain views about what it really means to be single. That is to say, about the nature 
of bachelorhood, of the nature of being single. And that's interesting because our linguistic practice is just running around the world talking. I, and I don't care who you are. You begin to develop these philosophical, folk philosophical views about the nature of the thing to which these ordinary word, words refer. Now, given the dependence, given the dependence of concepts on the meanings of words, you might think that conceptual questions are simply questions of lexicography, right? Lexicography being what dictionary folks do when they're compiling dictionary definitions. It's a matter of just identifying the ordinary linguistic conventions, the surface linguistic conventions that, that, that uh, express the application conditions for the word. But conceptual analysis becomes necessary where definitions leave off. And definitions leave off in places where people have in strong philosophical intuitions about what the things to which the words refer really are. And those philosophical, uh, those ph philosophical intuitions condition their views about the real nature of the thing. Now, to say that, that conceptual analysis is not just about meanings of ordinary or lexical meanings of words, that it's not just lexicography, is not to say that meanings are irrelevant. Ordinary meanings are the gold standard when it comes to conceptual analysis. Although it goes beyond mean, meanings to identify deeper intuitions, and these intuitions are phil philosophical, or uh, metaphysical actually, because they span all possible worlds, right? Um, about the nature of the thing defined by the words. Well, I'll give you an example, possible worlds, right? When I asked you whether this possible world that, that had a legal system that looked exactly like Spain's but lacked any coercive, uh, authorized coercive sanctions, I was talking about other possible worlds nothing that exists in this world, right? That's a, a non-existent possibility. So when we start thinking about conceptual analysis, when we start thinking about um, what the, the nature of a thing, are these intuitions that inform our views are metaphysical. They don't just apply to existing things. They t apply to all possible things of the kind. So, although conceptual analysis goes beyond meanings to identify the deeper intuition, deeper intuitions, metaphysical intuitions about the nature of a thing, the thing defined by the words, a conceptual theory of a thing, other things being equal, has to be at least consistent with the meaning of the word that we use to refer to that thing. And I say other things e equal, being equal because, you know, it might be true that some convention that we have for using some word is just incoherent. That doesn't happen often, if at all. But if that's the case, then, then th an incoherent definition will not ground a conceptual theory of the thing that the, defini that the, the, the definition, okay, I'm having trouble. Um, if the meaning of a word is incoherent, there's no conceptual theory, theory about it. There's no, concept, there's no conceptual theorizing about, a something, about something that's self-contradictory. There's nothing, nothing to be said about it because everything can be said about it. A, a contradiction logically implies every possible proposition. Okay, so what is the nature of a thing? The nature of a thing is defined by its essential properties. And I don't like this word, essential, um, because some people read it as though the nature of a thing, according to people who do metaphysically driven conceptual analysis, can never change. And that's not true. The nature of the, th of the thing can change to the extent that our ordinary linguistic conventions for talking about the thing change, right? Any philosophical theory, analysis of a concept, supervenes on the ordinary meanings of the word. If the ordinary meanings change, then so does the, the conceptual theory, and that means so does the nature. Um, having made that qualification, right, uh, using the word essential is somewhat harmless here. A property P is essential to being a C, 
if and only if, and I should actually say given a particular set of meanings in a, at a particular moment in time, just so I don't have to worry about the objection, to the essentialism objection. A property P is essential to being a C given the, um, the existing definitions of a C at that particular time, if and only if it is not conceptually possible for something to be a C unless it has P. So being unmarried is essential to being single given our conventions for using the term single as they are now. Um, is essentially being single in the sense that something cannot be single unless they're unmarried. You can't be a person who's both single and married. Oh, I, uh, okay, sorry. Thank you. And yeah, just holler because, you know, I, I'm looking everywhere but at anybody, so. Yeah, just holler when I do that. So I'm sorry, let me go through this again. The, the nature of the thing is defined by its conceptually essential properties, um, and, but these, pro these essential properties are relative to a particular set of ordinary linguistic conventions that obtain in a, in a, a community of competent speakers at a particular moment. Those conventions can change, and so can, hence, the conceptually essential properties. So a property P is essential to being a C given the existing conventions at the time, if and only if it's not conceptually possible for something to be a C unless it has P. So being unmarried is essential to being a single. Being single given our conventions at this moment in time for using the locution single in the sense that something can't be single. It's conceptually impossible for something to be single given these conventions at this particular moment unless they're unmarried. Given these conventions at this particular moment, there can't be a person who's both single and, uh, and married. That's a contradiction. The nature of a thing seeds, whatever it is, law, bachelorhood, singleness, whatever, is defined by all the properties that are essential, given the existing conventions at the time, to being a seed. So the nature of being single is defined at least in part, by the conceptually essential properties of one being unmarried. Oh, why did I, uh, two is wrong, sorry. I changed that from bachelor. Yeah, and bachelor is usually, I'm sorry, usually uh, used to, uh, to uh, refer to, to men. Being unmarried and being an adult, right? If you, to be single, you gotta be unmarried and adult. It doesn't make any sense to wonder about whether a nine-year-old is single. And if you are, talk to somebody <laughs> soon. You have a problem. Um, <clears throat> the role of intuitions in conceptual analysis. You know, people always complain about the methodology, for uh, philosophical methodology in general, not just, not just conceptual analysis. People worry about the role of intuitions in ethics. Oh, man, you know, there's no evidence. It's just what you happen to think. No, it's not just what we happen to think. We're part of a community, and the intuitions have to be shared by a community because what's going on when you give a philosophical argument with respect to what's ethically right or with respect to the concept of a concept is we're trying to give a theory that accounts for intuitions, that theorizes intuitions that are widely shared across the population. The starting point for conceptual analysis is our ordinary understanding about how the relevant word applies to things. Otherwise put, it begins from ordinary metaphysical intuitions, and they're metaphysical, they're philosophical, they're metaphysical in, about the nature of the thing, and they're metaphysical, again, because they apply to all possible cases, right? Not just existing cases. But insofar as the nature of a thing is determined by the lexical meanings of the word we use to refer to it, these intuitions are going to come from our understanding of the term and the little philosophical views that we all unconsciously develop about the nature of the thing <coughs> to which the word refers. And it happens for everybody. You know, um, I, uh, my wife and I, we don't have kids, but we, I had, we have nieces. And you know, I would sometimes ask philosophical questions of my oldest niece when she was about 10 years old. 
and she had intuitions about cases like Bachelor, uh, you know, whether the Pope is a bachelor and so on. It just happens, it's part, I mean, we're philosophical beings by nature, um, and it starts fairly early in kids. Okay, conceptual analysis. Is it important? Um, does, it, does conceptual analysis have any practical implications? Nah, in my view, not generally, no. You know, whether or not positivism or classical, positive, uh, classical natural law theory is true, or whether inclusive or exclusive legal positivism is true, doesn't tell you anything that's going to help you practice law, to be honest. I mean, what I think conceptual theorizing, there's value in conceptual theorizing, and the value comes from the kind of thinking you have to put into it, right? It's extremely abstract. It's, it's, it, it, to do it well, it's extremely rigorous. I think, you know, personally, I think anybody who's practiced, who, who wants to practice law should take a course in conceptual legal theory in order to develop the more abstract skills, um, reasoning skills. But does it have practical implications? No, look, all, all of these theories are compatible with I mean, you could tell a story about any existing legal system that's compatible with any theory you like. Um, you might wind up saying some odd things, but it just doesn't have any practical implications, as far as I can tell. Does that mean it's useless? No, I don't think so. Um, some important issues sometimes turn on conceptual questions. For example, what counts as a medical use of marijuana? Um, I was told recently, I, I was told today that um, weed is legal here for recreational use? I think so. Okay, look, you know, but before weed became legal, I mean, weed is legal in, in my state, in recreational and medical use. I, I live in Washington. You know, you had to ask certain kinds of questions about whether or not and why, what uses you might legalize weed for. So initially, the way it's generally worked historically is that most states in the United States have started out by legalizing medical use. But the question is, what counts as a medical use, right? Weed for medical use is legal in 30 to 50 US states, at least at the time I wrote this, first wrote this uh, slide. Um, it's legal for all uses, including purely recreational use in just nine US states. So tell me, you know, I mean, what's the difference between a medical use and a recreational use. You might think that's easy. I don't, I don't think so. Let's talk about alcohol, for example. Um, I hope y'all don't mind my asking personal questions about you. How many of you consume alcohol? <laughs> no, I, how many of you? I, I've got to know. How many of you consume weed? <laughs> um, has anybody ever used alcohol before going to a party to relax themselves so that they could, they could talk to people comfortably? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Right? And no one else. All y'all are just so... No one else has ever used alcohol as a social lubricant. Okay, fair enough. If you have used it, that's actually a medical use. And the reason that's a medical use, or at least arguably a medical use, is because the point is to, to um, diminish your anxiety in a social setting. You know, look, they, they got drugs for that. Xanax, Valium, you know, they prescribe drugs for, for anxiety. Um, so there's an issue, in, and using alcohol as a social lubricant is one of the most common uses. In fact, I gotta say this, okay, look, you might be, if you're a wine snob, and I don't mean anything bad by wine snob, there are people who just love red wine. You know, or wine, sniff it, savor it, roll it around in their mouth. See, I'm not one of those people. I drink to get high. That's what I do. You know, I, everything I do, I do to get high. It's how I roll. Um, um, okay, then, okay, that's, that's one use that doesn't count. That's a healthy use, a comparatively healthy use that doesn't count as a, a medical use. But look, if you're not using it as a social lubricant and you're not using it to savor the flavor, at home, then you're just using it to get drunk. And that, to tell you the truth, I mean, I don't actually really use anything to get high. I have some sort of ulterior purpose, including smoking weed. 
If you're just sitting around the house getting drunk, yeah, that's recreational, but that's unhealthy, right? I mean, I'll be honest about myself. I use weed because I have a, a really vicious insomnia problem. If I don't use weed, I have to use Ambien or something that's prescribed, which doesn't, I don't sleep as well, and I think those drugs are dangerous. So, you know, I don't, yeah, I mean, when I'm on the road, I have to, I'll bring a, a, a script of Ambien because I don't have weed, but at home, I will not use that stuff because it's dangerous. So I actually use weed, I think, medically, even though nobody, there's not one state in the United States that recognizes treatment of insomnia as a medical use for weed. Um, so what the point I want to make is that the, the distinction between a medical use and a recreational use is it, well, it needs a little bit of elaboration in theory because what seems like recreational uses sometimes turn out to be medical uses. Using alcohol as a social lubricant seems to be, at first blush, a recreational use, but uh, upon further consideration, it actually is a medical use if Xanax, Valium, other uh, mild, uh, other anti-anxieties, our medications are used for medical purposes. Um, sorry. See, this is actually why I'm not sure that I want stuff posted on YouTube. <laughs> but I signed it already, so what can I do? You know, one thing that I that I I used to do when when people would people would do that, I'd sign the paper, and then I would say. The most, at some point during the lecture, the most profound, profoundly, uh, the most profound um, profanity, right? I throw the f bomb or something, damn f bomb, a couple of times, and you know what? That would ne that wouldn't get to YouTube, but I won't do that here because Edgar's my, my homie. <laughs> um, all right, uh, there are two kinds of concepts. There's uh, two kinds of concept actually. Evaluative and descriptive concepts. Now, a purely descriptive content, concept doesn't tell you anything about whether something is, a, is good or, or not. Um, an evaluative concept purports to tell you something about, it makes some kind of a, a quality judgment about the thing of which it's a concept. Um, for example, the concept term liar or the concept term bachelor, purely descriptive. You know, you call somebody a bachelor, hey, there's no judgment being made about your moral quality or anything, their moral quality or anything else. That's just a purely descriptive term. It's the state, somebody who is bachelor, a bachelor is simply someone who is not unmarried. Liar, however, is an evaluative concept that has descriptive content. The descriptive content is somebody who habitually tells falsehoods, but that's not all there is to it. Right? Look, if someone calls you a liar, they're insulting you. So there's, an eva there's an, uh, some evaluative content as well. Someone who habitually tells falsehoods, knowingly tells falsehoods, you've got to know that you're telling a, fal that you're telling a, a falsehood to lie, um, and is a bad, morally bad, in virtue of it. So liar is an evaluative concept in the sense that, well, it's... It's thick, evaluative and descriptive, but I just call it evaluative because it has, in addition to descriptive content, I did it again, some evaluative concept, content. Sorry, let me do it start. Purely descriptive concept doesn't tell you anything about whether something is good. An evaluative concept purports to tell you whether something's good or not. Bachelor, purely descriptive, there's nothing bad or good about being unmarried. Um, I mean, whether it is, is up to you. If you're somebody who's unmarried and you want to get married, you, well, you're going to be upset about it. If you're unmarried and happy about being unmarried, you're not going to get upset about it. So it's neutral. Evalu normatively or evaluatively neutral. Liar is not. Descriptive content, somebody who tells habitually and knowingly tells falsehoods and who is bad, a bad person in virtue of that. Now, it turns out there's two concepts of art, and I'm going to argue two concepts of law, a descriptive and an evaluative. The descriptive concept of art, well, anything that, that somebody um, paints or music that somebody writes that is intended to produce some kind of an aesthetic experience presented to an audience for the purpose of inducing an aesthetic experience is a piece of art. 
knowing that something is a piece of art in a descriptive sense doesn't tell you anything about whether it's good or bad. If, there, you, know, if you have a, a, a painting of, I don't know, a black velvet painting of L that's hanging on your wall, that's art. Whether it's good or not depends, I guess, on what your views are about what constitutes art as good. But then there's an evaluative concept of art as well. And you hear this one being deployed by people who, when, they, when they're looking at certain abstract paintings, they'll say something like this, in a museum, that's not art. My three-year-old can do that, or my six-year-old can do that. They're not claiming that it's not art in a purely descriptive sense. They're claiming it's bad art. It's and, and, bad to the point of even, even being insulting. You know, people who have these views about abstract art, and I'm not one of them, as far as I'm concerned, the most interesting art is always, always abstract. Um, they feel almost insulted by the fact that somebody put this stuff up in a museum and that they might have paid an entry fee to see. So, two concepts of art. Purely, there's one that's descriptive, makes no, kind of, no judgments of quality whatsoever with respect to the things that are called art. Evaluative, it, it distinguishes those things that are merely art from those things that are good art. And there's no conflict between the two, none. I mean, everything that is evaluative art is descriptively art, and, but some things that are descriptively art are not evaluatively art. There would be a conflict only if the two concepts of, uh, no, no, I was about to say something false, sorry. Similarly, there are two concepts of law. A purely descriptive concept that doesn't purport to evaluate the quality of a legal system, moral quality, or aesthetic quality, or any quality in, with respect to any standards of, uh, of a legal system, just defines a legal system maybe as you know, those norms that are enforced by, or made by legislatures, applied by courts, enforced by police, something like that. And then there's an evaluative concept of law that evaluates the, the, the quality of a legal system or the quality of a particular law, right? Somebody might say that an enactment Oh, well, okay. In the United States, you know, we're, we're having this, this big debate about abortion, and uh, people frequently say that Roe v. Wade isn't law. Now, there are two ways to interpret that, one of which is insulting. If you interpret them as meaning law in the descriptive sense, then in a way you're insulting them. You're, you're essentially saying, look, you don't understand, you don't have a clue as to what it means for something to be law in the descriptive sense. What they mean is, in the evaluative sense, that it's illegitimate or bad law, right? I mean, and egregiously so. And that's what people who, who think Roe v. Wade should be overturned believe, for a, for a lot of reasons. Okay, conceptual theories of law. These theories are concerned to explain or, exp explain the, or explicate the content of certain legal concepts. What's the nature of the legal system? What properties are essential to being a legal system such that anything that lacks one of these properties is not properly characterized as a legal system? Most, you know, there's this view, this quiet view that began with Hart and Raz that it's not a conceptually necessary feature of a legal system that it authorizes sanctions for the violations of some, some norms. So on this view, right, a society of angels can have a legal system. If, however, you take the position as I do that now there's no such thing as a legal system without uh, authorized course of enforcement mechanisms for at least some, some views, uh, some violations of law, then the Society of Angels example that Raz is famous for, it's not an example of a legal system. And then, okay, so that's, you know, there's, there's a conceptual theory of, a, of law qua legal system and then there's a conceptual theory of law qua norm. What is the nature of a law? What properties must something have to count as a law of some legal system? Um, if you're a classical natural law theorist, at least on the traditional view, interpretation of that view, you think that something that is immoral can't count as law. It's a conceptually necessary condition for the existence of a legal norm. 
a valid legal norm in any conceptually possible legal system that it satisfies certain moral requirements of justice such that an unjust law is no law at all. Um, and positivism, positivists deny that. Okay, so legal positivism, one of the two major um, conceptual theories of law. Legal positivism is the view that the content of law is fully determined or manufactured by what officials recognize, apply, and enforce as law. So there are two theses that express what I take to be the core content of legal positivism. How am I doing for time? Because I want to make sure there's time for questions. Huh? Four or five minutes over about. Um, how many minutes? Over four or five minutes, but you're already <laughs> far enough. Yes. Ten minutes is all right? I can, I'll, I'll finish this up, yeah. Okay. This, uh, uh, so the artifact, the positivists are committed to the artifact thesis. Laws and artifact all the way down. It's fully, the content of law is fully manufactured, right? Law is a special kind of artifact. People build it. Without people, there is no law. The separability thesis, there, is no, there are no necessary moral constraints on the content of what counts as law in, any, in a particular legal system. Two kinds of natural law theory. There's a theory of morality and a theory of law, and they're logically independent. The log the natural law theory of morality is a theory of objective morality that, that grounds moral truths in the nature of things. And then there's the classical natural law theory of law, which holds that it denies the separability thesis and holds that it's a conceptual necessary condition for the, for, uh, the existence of a law, that it's just. Um, construed as anti-positivist, okay, and, and there are a couple of different views. There's, there's uh, the classical view um, that Aquinas held, and then some people, there's the interpretist, interpretivist view of Dworkin. If you construe these Dworkin's view and Finnis's view as being genuinely anti-positivist in the sense that it denies the separability thesis and holds that there, as a descriptive matter, there can be no unjust law, then they're false according to ordinary definitions of law and legal practice, as we'll see. Definition of law, I, I don't remember which um, dictionary I got this out of. The system of rules that a particular country... Oh, I'm so sorry, I keep doing this. The system of rules that a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and may enforce by the imposition of penalties. There's nothing in this definition that says anything about law having to satisfy some moral test, a norm having to satisfy some moral test account as law. Okay, so if you think that it's a conceptual truth as far as the descriptive concept of law is concerned, that law has to, to be satisfy, has to be just, something has to be just to count as law, one, that's inconsistent with the ordinary meanings of the word law that determine the content of our concepts. Secondly, construed anti-positivist, interpretivism and natural law theory are false of legal systems like the U.S. legal system. Legal practice in the U.S. Courts, uncontroversial that courts do not have the authority to change or invalidate a properly enacted law on the ground that it is unjust. I forget the case, I didn't put the name of it down, quote, whether embodied in the 14th Amendment or inferred from the 5th, equal protection is not a license for courts to judge the wisdom, fairness, or logic of legislative choices. A legislative choice is not subject to courtroom fact-finding and may be based on rational speculation unsupported by evidence or empirical data. Only by faithful adherence to this guiding principle of judicial review of legislation is it possible to preserve the legislative branch, its rightful independence, and its ability to function. In other words, the court says, we don't have the authority just to declare something invalid just because it's unjust. This implies that there can be unjust laws. So, look, if what you're trying, if what you're doing when you're doing conceptual analysis is trying to give an analysis of the descriptive concept of law, and it's true, as I suggest, that giving uh, that the content of, the, of, of a con our concepts is determined by the ordinary meanings of words, which are, in the case of law, conditioned by legal practice, in the same way that the meaning of water is conditioned by the scientific finding that water is H2O, then anti-positivist views are all false, and pretty straightforwardly false. 
if this is the game you're trying to play, and it's, it's certainly the game I'm playing, then anti-positivism is clearly, and it is false. And Dworkin, Finnis have to be construed differently. Um, what I think that Dworkin and Finnis are really doing is explicating the evaluative concept of law. What distinguishes laws that are good from laws that are not in some sense. That is, those theories explain ex explain what it means to be law in the fullest sense or moral sense, like the concept of art, the, the, the evaluative concept of art that you know thinks that, that that people deploy when they think abstract art is not art in the evaluative sense. They're saying it's not art in the fullest sense, in the ideal sense. What art ought to be at its best. That's what I think. That's the way I think. Dworkin and Finnish should be interpreted as explaining the conditions under which something that counts as law is law in its fullest or ideal sense, and that usually means morally fullest, morally ideal. And as it turns out, that's exactly what they think they were doing, right? I mean, this idea that John Finnis took, takes the view that it's conceptually impossible to have unjust laws in a, in a sense that, that is opposed to positivism is false. He says, in describing his view, quote, there is no necessary or conceptual connection between positive law and morality. Yep, for there are immoral positive laws. Quote, there are two broad categories with many subclasses of unjust laws, end quote. The quote, the identification of the existence and content of law does not require resort to any moral argument, close quote. True, for how else could one identify wicked laws? Now maybe Aquinas and Anselm, no, not Anselm, and Augustine were hardline natural law theorists in the anti-positivist sense with respect to the descriptive content of law. But Finnis doesn't hold that view. Um, Mark Greenberg seems to hold a view, um, but to, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure whether he does because he employs a somewhat different vocabulary than positivists do in part because he believes that vocabulary is illegitimate. Um, Dworkin, quote, we, in Law's Empire, we need not deny that the Nazi system was an example of law. Of course it is an example of law according to the descriptive sense conditioned by the order, ordinary meanings of the descriptive term law because there's an available sense in which it plainly was law. But we have no difficulty in understanding someone who, does, who says, does say that Nazi law was not really law or was law in a degenerate set, sense or was less than fully law. For then he is not using law in that sense. He is not making that sort of pre-interpretive judgment. That's what positivists do. That's what, I, that's what I do. But a skeptical interpretive judgment, right, the evaluative concept of law, that Nazi law lacked features crucial to flourishing legal system whose rules and procedures do justify conclusions, uh, justify coercion. Now let me just say something real quick by way of conclusion here. This, uh, what, I, what I do like about this chapter, you know, I mean, I'm not, I think, the, like I said, the, topic of, the topics of the book are largely anachronistic. Um, once you get clear on methodology, you can't, you can't do substantive legal theory, conceptual analysis well, unless you get clear on the methodology. You've got to know, be consciously aware of what, it, what game it is you're playing if you're going to play the game well. And if you notice, the, most of the material in this presentation, I, I think it's probably in the chapter as well, is devoted to explicating and justifying the methodology and making it intuitively plausible. And once I have it, it was easy to arrive at the conclusion that you shouldn't be interpreting Finnis and Dworkin as um, articulating the content of the descriptive concept of law. You, they should be interpreted as, in, as explicating the content of the evaluative concept of law. And that is, as a matter of fact, all they intended to do, contrary to a whole lot of people who think otherwise. Okay, now I'm done. And I